Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to International Observe the Moon Night from Albuquerque. I'm Jim Greenhouse, the Space Science Director at the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, this is sort of an experimental project. Uh, this is the first time we've tried to broadcast live over YouTube in this particular way. Uh, we wanted to do this for you tonight so that as many people uh, could join as possible and nobody had to sign up and there was no time limit or anything. Um, we are uh, going to um, observe a self-imposed time limit of about 45 minutes tonight. Um, so we will be going for just a little while, but not for a really long time. And uh, I just wanted to let you know that uh, uh, this um, will be sort of a um, experiment to see if we can do programs like this in the future. Um, and we've done some tests and everything's gone fine, but we're broadcasting live over the internet, so anything could happen. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a warning, uh, and hopefully things will go very smoothly tonight. Um, so uh, you can see over on the right-hand side of the screen that the, uh, there's some links in the chat. Um, if you saw our advertisements either on YouTube or Facebook or on the museum's website, uh, you may have tried to click the link to download the guide for tonight. Well, I found out about two hours ago that NASA changed the link at some point. So that the old link was working about halfway through the week, and sometime in the last couple of days, uh, NASA changed the link to try to make it easier to find, but then the old link stopped working. So I only found out about that recently. So I put the current link for downloading the guide for exploring the moon in the chat. It's the first link in the chat, but uh, uh, it's actually the second uh, posting in the chat there. And um, it's the one that uh, starts off with, uh, or that ends with observe the moon. And um, well, actually they both do that. Sorry about that. Anyway, it's the second uh, chat in the chat box. So if you click on that link, you can actually download the guide for tonight and follow along when we explore the moon here in just a few moments. Um, also, this is International Observe the Moon Night, so there's several celebrations happening all across the world, and there's actually a live broadcast also happening on uh, NASA's uh, live, uh, NASA TV's live feed. And I think if you go to the International Observe the Moon Night website that you can watch that broadcast, um, and uh, that is the third chat item that you see there, that link, so uh, you can... We hope that you're not going to stop watching us and go over to the other one. Uh, I guess if you're really awake, you can try watching both at the same time. But they're going to have some very interesting stuff on that after we're done here in a little while. So we hope you'll go over to the, uh, the NASA broadcast for International Observe the Moon Night. Okay. Also, in the chat, I'm, uh, they said they were connected, but I'm beginning to get a little worried because I haven't seen them show up there. Uh, our two planetary geologists at the museum... Uh, Dr. Larry Crumpler and Jana Bell should be online to answer any questions that you type into the chat. So I'm not going to stop and ask for questions at some point during this broadcast. If you have a question, you can type uh, those um, questions into the chat at any time, and hopefully Jane and Larry will be able to answer those for you. Uh, so you're in very knowledgeable hands with them because they know just a little bit about uh, pretty much everything in the entire solar system. So you can ask them questions about the moon and also the other planets in the solar system, uh, pretty much anything, and the other moons in the solar system as well. Um, all right, so I think those are all the introductions that I need to go through tonight. So let me switch over and introduce uh, one of the uh, interesting things that we found out that was happening um, is that We've got a camera set up on Misty Carty, and she is one of the educators at the museum. Her friends call her Dr. Misty, and for some reason, the feed from her camera on her laptop keeps changing size. In fact, it just changed size while, while I was talking about it. So um, we will try to keep that under control, <laughs> but that was something we couldn't work out uh, while we were trying to get the broadcast going tonight. So um, I think that's all I needed to say to introduce Misty. We'll switch over to her live view from her telescope here in just a moment, and we, we're getting a beautiful picture from that just a few moments ago. So, Misty, what does the sky look like right now? Oh, well, the sky's hopefully cooperating, and it's going to stay cooperating. We do have some high cirrus clouds, but uh, it's uh, fading into more of a haze than a big cloud bank, so hopefully that'll continue. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so for tonight, I wanted to welcome all of you to um, our virtual International Observe the Moon Network. Uh, uh, the Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science is very proud to be among nearly 2,000 observing the moon this year. Tonight, we're going to learn about and explore the moon utilizing uh, my telescope and my digital camera. And for reference, for anyone out there who uh, is a telescope enthusiast or an amateur astronomer themselves, I'm using a Celestron 8SE, and my uh, camera is a Sony mirrorless A7 II, which is mounted at the focus to the telescope instead of using an eyepiece. And through uh, the feed from the camera is going to my laptop, and then the camera is going to my laptop, and then thankfully to uh, Jim, who is broadcasting it out all to everyone on YouTube. Um, so let's go ahead and get started celebrating our Earth's constant companion. So the phase of the moon this evening is called a waxing gibbous. And if you had observed, observed the moon a few nights ago, it was around a first quarter, and if you see it in a few days from now, it's going to be a full moon. And the question we often hear, particularly um, at the museum when we're doing events like this, is why do we have phases of the moon? Why do we see them? And I just wanted to go over really quickly some really cool facts about the moon that explain why we see different amounts of it illuminated from here on Earth. So one of the first cool fact, cool fact is, that is that the moon actually goes around, goes around or orbits the Earth about once every 28 days. days. And, I and I have this really cool, fun, fun ori here. And so, and so this is the and sun, this is our Earth, and this is our Earth, and this. So they're not to scale, um, but for the purpose of tonight, it fits into my uh, camera feed. And I can show you that my little moon here goes around the Earth. So it's orbiting around the Earth. And it goes counterclockwise as it's orbiting. So if you look at a clock face, uh, instead of the hands going in the direction um, that we're used to, the moon actually goes in the opposite direction that the hands on a clock go. And um, the second cool fact about our moon that helps give us our phases and it looks the way that it does is that the same side of the moon is always facing the Earth. And this is because it takes the moon the same amount of time to orbit the Earth as it does to spin or rotate once. So we're familiar with spin here on Earth because it takes us about 24 hours or one whole day to spin once. And so for the moon, the crazy thing is, is that it is spinning, but it's doing it at the same rate that it's orbiting. And that makes it so we always see the same side. But these two facts alone, so cool. These are cool um, facts. They alone, um, they alone don't explain why we experience phases of the moon. And so I'm actually going to turn off my uh, film light over here. So that I so that I can use my sun to light up. And so if we see if and so if we see if looking at the orrery when the sun is shining light on both the, the, earth, the moon and the earth, you can see that the moon has a shadow. So just like you or I have a shadow when we stand out in the sunlight, the moon has a shadow too. And the earth has a shadow. And we're used to calling the earth shadow nighttime. So which is what we're doing. So which is what we're doing. We're, we're about to enter right now is the nighttime on earth, the earth's shadow. And so as the moon orbits the Earth and we see different amounts of the side facing us lit up by the sun. Okay. And so the combination of these really cool facts, the fact that the same side of the moon is facing the Earth, the moon having a shadow, and the moon orbiting the Earth results in us here on Earth seeing the phases of the moon. So, um, okay, Jim, we're so um, Jim, we're going to go ahead and look at our now. beautiful waxing gibbous moon now. And I'm going to... Uh, 
And I'm going to uh, center my moon a little bit. So for everyone at home, uh, just so you know what's happening here. Now, because the Earth is rotating and the moon is orbiting, the moon actually moves across our sky every day. Um, the picture, hopefully, if I'm doing everything properly with my telescope, um, is going to hopefully stay in our field of view. And that is because my telescope is tracking the moon. So my telescope is actually moving at the same rate that the moon is moving due to the Earth's spin and its motion around us in its orbit to keep it in that in that um, frame. Now I'm going to zoom in and I have to do that manually with my camera. So I'm going to be touching my camera and telescope. So I may have to recenter it from time to time. Also, just so you guys are aware, um, the sun has just set and we're in our twilight part of the um, of uh, our night sky right now. And everything is cooling down, which means my whole telescope and my camera will be cooling down as well, which means my focus of my telescope may change. And so there may be times where things might look a little blurry and I'll let you know in that moment when I'm actually adjusting everything. Okay, so now that we're looking at our beautiful waxing gibbous moon, um, there's some distinct areas on the moon that we can see right away. So there are light regions and there are dark regions. The lighter regions are known as the lunar highlands and the dark regions are called Maria which is Latin for seas. And if we refer to just one dark region, it is called a mar or a a sea. The highlands are older than the Maria, the highlands well are older than the Maria as well as made of different types the of lunar rock. The moon, we theorize, formed roughly four and a half billion years ago from the impact of a large planetesimal around um, the size of Mars, maybe a little smaller with our very young Earth. And researchers at the University of New Mexico actually just released a new study about lunar rocks helping to add credence to this formation theory of the moon. And so when that impact happened, lots of material um, was ejected up into space. And um, some scientists have actually said for a brief period of time, our young Earth might have actually looked a little bit similar to Saturn with having rings of debris orbiting around it. That debris coalesced into our moon and the highlands actually first formed from the cooling of the moon's original molten surface. The maria are low-lying basins and they were created from impacts of asteroids. These impacts were actually so large and powerful, they created cracks in the lunar crust and lunar magma was able to rise up through those cracks. And the basins filled up with lunar lava that eventually cooled and turned into fresh or younger lunar rock. And it's composed of slightly different material too because by that point, we have a crust and we have a lower level that's a magma level. That means that our material has separated into lighter material and heavier material. So both the highlands and the maria are covered in craters as well. We can see that looking at the picture, right? Um, we're going to visit the most prominent crater that I can actually see right, right, right now, which is called Copernicus. And it's on the left side of the moon in the middle um, towards the edge. And that is a really large crater. And we're going to get to go visit it in a minute. But if you look really closely, we can see lots and lots of other craters. So both of them are highlands are, both the highlands and the Maria are covered in craters and they are made by asteroids, they're made by by micrometeors and comets and, and comets and impacting the surface of the moon. The moon hasn't been geologically majorly geologically active in a very long time and it doesn't have an atmosphere. So it has a really long history or record of impacts hitting it. And if you were to count, you'd actually find that the highlands, being older, have more craters than those younger Maria. Okay. I'm going to take a sip of water. And then we're going to move on to some of these lunar features. Okay, so the first one Okay, so the first one that I talked about was Copernicus crater. So I'm going to zoom in on my camera and things are going to get a little shaky just for a moment while I do this. Now 
I'm gonna let it settle out. I'm gonna let it settle out for a moment. Oh, awesome. Oh, awesome. Okay, so there in the very center of the frame, the large crater that's there is called Copernicus Crater, and it's almost 60 miles in diameter. Terraced walls, which means that the walls kind of look like they step out. There's higher points and lower points as you get to the walls. Or like a terrace crops, if you've ever seen a crop field that's terraced. It has a flat, has a flat floor, floor and, a and a group of central peaks in the very, in the very center, center of it. I can I'm see as I'm looking at my, at my feeds, I can see at least two of the peaks in the center of Copernicus right now. Those central peaks are three quarters of a mile high above the floor of the crater. And the crater is over two miles deep. This is a relatively fresh crater. It's believed to have formed less than a billion years ago. And it has a system of really bright, prominent ejector rays radiating away from the crater. And I'm going to move Copernicus back into the center a little bit. And we'll hold here so it can settle. And we can get a nice view of it. I mean, the white lines, I mean, the white that, lines see that you are, see uh, that are uh, out going crater, out from the crater, the ejecta, those are the ejecta they're talking about. Those, are, talking about. those, those are, are from the impact that created Copernicus crater. Okay. Okay. Now, now we're going <clears> to go to our next which stop, is actually, which is actually um, just, um, to just to the Copernicus northeast crater? of Copernicus crater. And I'll let the, I'll let the feed, settle a little feed settle. So, so you did you know, know that the moon has the mountains? Moon has mountains? These, are the These are the Apennine Mountains. And this mountain range, this is, part this mountain range is part of the east of the rim Mars of one of those Mars I was talking Mars about called Mar Imbrium. And it's an impact basin. This range is a little, this range over, is a little over 150 miles long, and it reaches over, and it reaches three, over miles three miles high. The Apollo 15, the landing, Apollo 15 site landing site is actually located the along the range's edge. western edge. So if we look at the, so feed, right look at the now, feed right look now, at and we look the at the mountain range is actually at curving, curving. at the end of it, there's a small crater. And if we follow that curve up to the north and it goes a little bit to the east, at the top of that, on the western side of the mountains there is where Apollo 15 landed. So astronauts David Scott and James Irwin landed at the edge of Mar Imbrium at the base of the towering Apennine Mountains, driving their rover across the Mar and up the lower mountain slope. And they gathered samples from both the dark Mar Plains and the surrounding light lunar highlands. So they got to sample both of those different types of rock, the young rock from the Mar and the older rock from the highlands. Okay. Now I'm going to move the camera again because we're going to go on to our next stop. And all of these stops, I forgot to say before we started, they're on the International Observe the Moon Night observation list that is for tonight. Um, and so what they do for International Observe the Moon Night is they pick specific spots that are close to the terminator of the moon. So the division between the lit part of the moon and the part that's still in shadow. And this is because it creates a large contrast and it's easier to see features. And so these sites are picked specifically for tonight because of the phase of the moon. So we'll move north and to the west a little bit. Sorry for the shaking. And I'm going to zoom in one more time. Okay. Okay. And so in the frame right now, we have a crater. And so the blurriness that you're seeing is potentially a little bit due to that cooling. I was also, I have some clouds that I can see in front of the moon that have thickened up a little bit. So we do have some haze that's obscuring it a little bit. But we're seeing through it, which is awesome. So on the, the left of your, of your uh, view, there's a crater that has a smooth floor that's dark. And if you look to the right of that, there's a line that looks like it's cutting through some of the lighter highlands. 
And that line is called Alpine Valley. So we're going from mountains into a valley. And <clears throat> these, um, the mountains here are actually called the Alps of the Moon uh, that this valley is cutting through. And so <clears throat> the valley, Alpine Valley, is almost 120 almost miles 120 long, miles long. Six miles wide. and it's a little over six miles wide. The Alpine Valley is an example of a grabin, a grabin which is German for ditch. Grabines are formed when land sinks between two parallel geological faults. And it ended up filling up, the grabine did, with that dark um, uh, lunar lava that ended up filling up the mar as well. It flowed into that grabine. And that's why it appears a little darker. Very awesome. Okay. So now what we'll do is if we continue, if you notice we've been going around the edge of Mar Imbrium um, for most of this, we're going to go over to the edge. And I'm going to zoom out just real quick and then zoom back in. And so what we're looking at here is we're looking at the terminator of the moon. So on the right half of the screen, we have the lit part of the moon, and on the left half, we have the shadow, the part of the moon that has not uh, received watch. Um, this portion of the moon, right there along that terminator, is where lunar sunrise is currently. And mostly obscured by the terminator right now is a bay that is um, called Sinus Aridum. And it lies um, um, right at the edge of Mar Imbrium. And unfortunately, I think probably due to the scene that we have tonight, there's actually some um, there's some um, features in the Mar that we can't see very clearly right now. But at this intersection between Sinus Iridium, Iridum <laughs> and um, Mar Imbrium, there's some stress features that actually make it look like there are waves that have been frozen in the Mar there, in the two, the bay meeting the sea there. But it's very cool to see that Terminator. And so if you watch, um, if you're, um, if you're interested in watching um, a lunar sunrise, you can actually watch over a whole nighttime. You'll see more of that part. The Terminator moves slightly, and you can actually see um, where there, the highlands actually could be catching the light sooner than you can in the lowlands, which is pretty awesome to watch. Okay, and so now we're going to head south um, of Mar Imbrium and Copernicus Crater. So there's going to be some shaking. So there's Copernicus Crater again. Still so pretty. <laughs> okay. I'm going to let the telescope and camera settle. Okay. And so now right here in the very, um, um, in the center of the frame, there is the crater called Alphonsus Crater. Um, so there looks like there's a chain running from the top of the frame to the south um, with the larger crater being on top, being slightly cut off by the top of the frame. Just below that is Alphonsus Crater. Um, the crater measures about 70 miles in diameter and was the target of the 1965 Ranger 9 robotic lunar mission. There's a network of rills, which is German for groove, uh, fracturing the floor of the crater, which are difficult to see tonight. I can make them out a little bit because I know exactly what I'm looking for. Um, if you go to NASA's moon track, you can see a beautiful picture of the floor of Alphonsus Crater and you can see these rills. Um, Rills are depressions that often look like uh, a dried riverbed. Um, there's three different types of them. So some of them are sinuous, some of them are straight, um, and there's different uh, formation theories for different types. And these um, um, have a volcanic relationship 
uh, because there are dark patches, you can see inside of the floor of the crater there, there's three of them. There's a central peak in the center, and then closer to the walls of Alphonse's crater, there are three dark patches. And these are actually from volcanic ash deposits where they erupted um, from small volcanic craters that are actually lying along the rills. And for me, I have some clouds moving in. <laughs> so our view is getting a little bit more and more obscure. <laughs> okay. Um, so now we'll move south. And I'm going to zoom out real quick and then zoom back in. So we can get to our proper location. And okay. So <clears throat> what we're looking at right now, if it wasn't cloudy, <laughs> there um, is a feature called the straight wall. Um, and so we are south of um, Alfonso's crater and we are in Mar Nubium. And there is a line here that is a little difficult to see. Um, that So there's three tiny craters here, um, almost in a line, a slight curves line. And just to the right of the center crater there in that line, there is a line going diagonally from the top of the frame to the south to the bottom of the frame um, from top almost like top left to, to bottom right and this is called the straight wall or um, and um, it's really spectacular when it's not cloudy <laughs> But this is a, an example of a lunar fault. Um, the line cuts along 75 miles the, across the floor of Mar Nubium, and it appears as a nearly straight line of shadow for a few days after first quarter. And then near third quarter, the wall is a straight line reflecting the sunlight. And, and this shows that the east side of the straight wall stands higher than the west side. And the tallest that it is in places, the straight wall is almost a quarter of, of a mile high. And so it's a feature that can actually stand out really well in small telescopes when there aren't clouds in front of the moon. <laughs> okay, so those are all of the stops that the International Observed the Moon Night had for tonight. And what I thought we could do really quickly is just go to a few um, other spots. I'm gonna quickly recenter my moon. So the reason why the moon looks so clear right now is because um, it is very bright. And I have settings set on my camera to adjust it for that brightness. And so the clouds that I can see, um, we're kind of cutting through them with the telescope and the camera settings right now. And so it looks very clear to you all at home. When we zoom in and we can't see those fine details, that's where the clouds become uh, really evident to um, um, our visibility of the moon. Um, so I'm gonna go down south to the bottom of the moon. And I'm gonna zoom in. And I'm gonna zoom in on Tycho Crater here, which is roughly about in the center of the frame now. Uh, very, very prominent, almost looks like a circle. It has a central peak. Uh, one side of it is uh, looks quite l light, and then the other part of it, um, it lo um, looks very dark. It's uh, got a curved shadow there because of the walls. And so this is one of my favorite pe uh, features. It's a feature you can see just looking up at the moon. Um, and part of what I like about it is that it has such very cool ejecta, which I'm going to move to, that you can see coming from it. So I've moved Tycho uh, down to the almost the bottom left corner-ish of, uh, of the frame there. Um, and then um, radiating away from it, there's white lines that you can see um, that are the ejecta from that crater being formed, which is very cool. Another site that you can see I'm going to go to it. It 
is the Sea of Tranquility. So this is where Apollo 11 first landed. And I'm going to zoom in on the um, area here. Sorry for the shaking. <laughs> and um, if, we, if you uh, look at the bottom edge of the dark part of that is creating the sea of tranquility um there that basin there is 